know your superpowers. If you want to build your own confidence, you need to believe in yourself before others can believe in you. You need to invest in yourself before others can invest in you. Thanks so much for joining us, Jenny Wood. This is a real pleasure. It is I'm, I'm, such a pleasure to be here, Tony. I'm delighted. I'm delighted. And uh, I've been, you know, I've been following your work uh, primarily on LinkedIn, getting your little nuggets. And I'm just so excited to have you as uh, as a guest today. And you've chosen, Jenny, to talk to us around the theme of confidence at work. Maybe start off telling us a little bit about why that's so important to you. There was a study that came out of the UK that stated that 75% of employees regularly feel a lack of confidence at work. Wow. And I've been there too. I have felt imposter syndrome regularly. I'm an executive at Google and I still feel it weekly at different points. I have felt insecure, undervalued, embarrassed by things I've done. So that stat, and I'm such a data person, that stat married with how I have felt throughout my career at different points makes me so passionate about helping increase confidence in others at work and outside of work as well. Yeah, I love that. And it really speaks to my heart, Jenny, which is why I'm so glad because I think the work that you produce online and the nuggets of wisdom you share really uh, help lift, lift people's confidence up because that's what I see as as my role is to help lift others up. So I'm so glad that we're that we're leaning into this. You've got three great points for us. So we're going to cut right into first your first point, which is know your superpowers. Know your superpowers. These are essentially your strengths, your talents, your passions. You should have them practiced and ready to roll off your tongue in any situation. Because if you want to build your own confidence, you need to believe in yourself before others can believe in you. You need to invest in yourself before others can invest in you. So, for example, my three superpowers are people leadership, stakeholder influence, and building things from startup to scale. And not only have I thought about these, I have them practiced and ready to roll off my tongue in any situation. So let's take, for example... My second superpower, which is stakeholder management. I always say this about my passion for stakeholder management or stakeholder influence, and it goes like this. At the end of the day, I think everything is stakeholder management or sales, frankly. Now, this could be mm. influencing my VP to adopt a new insights program or simply convincing my husband to order sushi versus Italian on a Saturday night. Everything is influence. <laughs> everything is sales. So is that, I, is that a hard sell, Jenny? You know, it's the not Italian? a hard sell. It's, it's okay, not a hard good. sell. <laughs> but I've had harder sells. I've had harder <laughs> sells. Sometimes who's doing laundry is the harder sell. <laughs> um, but because I have that practice, I have used that line, Tony, about sushi versus mm. Italian dozens, if not hundreds of times in interviews, in mentorship conversations, as I'm describing my superpowers. Because it's always mm. a, a, a sweet little anecdote that brings some personality into that superpower. But it's come from practice and it's come from identifying first what those three superpowers are. Yeah. So you're there, you're then able to lean in to share. And I love that you've, you've brought a little, um, you know, personality and humility that you don't always get your way. It sounds like that's, yeah. oh, you that's know, so definitely true. <laughs> um, and I, and I love that. And, and certainly when I was, you know, when I hear you talk about know your superstars, it reminds me of kind of the two key things that I always share to folks when they're, looking to kind of build or grow their career. I talk about, firstly, you want to build rapport and that's the relationship yeah. side, which you brought in as like an anecdote and, and also establish credibility. Yeah. And that's kind of showcasing your superpowers. I wonder what else, what else can come up and how else can folks who are listening here who are thinking, yes, I want to build my confidence. I kind of have an idea of my superstar, or excuse me, superpowers. What else could they possibly do to kind of showcase that? Well, one thing that is helpful to showcase it is to think about your mix of superpowers. So, mm. for example, uh, someone who I mentor, her name is Martina. She came to me and she said, Jenny, I did our superpowers exercise. I thought about what mine are. And the three I've come up with are executive communications, organization and supporting others. So, mm. you know, she was 80 percent of the way there. But what I'm going to offer that might be additionally useful to your listeners 
is think about your mix of superpowers, your hard mm. skills versus your soft skills. And for you, you had a hard skill in there with building credibility, right? And you mix mm. that with a relationship building skill as well. So I pushed Martina to think about how she could tweak the language of those same three superpowers to convey one or two of them as even harder skills because they all mm. sound pretty soft, pretty people relationship focused, executive communications, organization and supporting others. But I know mm. from working with Martina that she's incredible at project and program management. She is so strong at go to market strategy. And frankly, I think that project and program management is really the same thing as organization. It's just a more yeah. business related way to say it. I think that supporting others is a wonderful thing to do but she does it in a way that is part of a go-to-market strategy when we are dealing with a lot of influencing and stakeholders and and mm. relationships. So I I pushed her to tweak the language slightly that in a way that maintains the base of those talents, passions, and skills, but makes it more of a well-rounded offering she's giving to somebody in an interview or in a mentorship meeting or in a one-on-one -on -one with her manager, for example. I love I love that you're really um encouraging Martina to ultimately give her superpowers the weight that they deserve, right? The fact exactly. that, because it is like you say, when I hear supporting others, uh, my question is, so what? Or to right. what end, right? And when, but then when you talk about Martina's going, going about her superpowers as a way to support others, to execute a strategy, I'm like, oh, that's, I, I want Martina on my team. Exactly. So I love that you've pulled that out. Martina's going to be a team player, but she's going to help me achieve my bottom line. And the other thing about superpowers is we have, this is really, this is about building confidence because you have to identify your superpowers to build your confidence. And even mm. that word, right? You could use the word strengths or talents or passions. I intentionally use the word superpowers, which by the way, let's talk, think about a global audience here. It feels a little bit American. It feels a little bit rah, rah. So if someone's an introvert. I'm so or glad you said that, Jenny, because I'm, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, as a Belfast man, I'm tweaking my accent slightly. You might not notice. That. Normally, I would say super powers, but I have to say <laughs> super powers for the global audience. But well, yes. it, it, it's 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 that it's the it's that, and it's also just being respectful and acknowledging that different cultures have different ways they approach this. Mm. A Latin American culture or some Asian cultures might feel very uncomfortable with the word superpower. Please note to any of you introverts listening or anybody from a different country that you could certainly replace the language superpowers with simply talents or skills or passions. Uh, but what it does is it, you're creating a personal brand for yourself because you have a personal brand whether you like it or not. So you may as well own that personal brand mm. you have. And even if I think about how the fact the fact that we have not yet met Tony until right now, and yet your brand is so palpable. One thing uh. that stood out to me was we had arranged this podcast a while ago, and then I got a, a picture from you over LinkedIn when I was giving a keynote, and it was a picture of me up on a screen. I was giving a virtual keynote. It was me up on a screen, and it was you taking a selfie with like this really fun face with me up big on the background because you had just finished delivering a session right before mine, and we don't know each other. This is literally the first time we're talking today, and yet I would offer that you have perhaps a superpower of building relationships through genuine connection. And... Right off the bat, I was so excited to meet you and have this conversation with you from that simple selfie you sent, which I would say is part of your brand and one of your superpowers. Well, well thank you. That's very kind. And actually, <laughs> it uh, it positions me well to ask the one question that I had around this particular first point, which is, you know, for folks like me, I get feedback from you saying, hey, you you must be really good at this. That must be one of your superstars. And it is. And I've been able to sort of gather feedback from people to understand kind of the value, the strengths that I have. What about the folks, remember we talked about at the very start, you said 75% of folks are lacking confidence in the workplace. What about the folks that are listening going, Jenny, I wish I knew that I had a superpower in the first instance. I wish I could figure out what it is. How do you go about encouraging and guiding others to discover their superpower? Yeah, this is a very common question. How do I know what I'm good at. Yeah. And the reality is 
we're all good at a lot of things. And so I think it's really just about how you communicate those strengths. So the first thing I would invite somebody to do is start making three lists. And these are free association lists. Grab, grab a piece of paper. You can, you can do it right now. You can do it later. And write down in the first column all the things you love to do as a kid. Mm-hmm. Call it, you know, early elementary school years or primary school years. All the things you love to do as a kid and all the things you were really good at as a kid. Those things that your teachers praised you for. Those things that you really enjoyed doing where you were in flow, even though in primary school, we didn't know what flow meant, <laughs> right? But those things that you were really excited to do, those things you loved to do. Second column, same thing. What are you good at? What do you love to do? What puts mm-hmm. you in your happy place? Kind of more in your adolescent and college years, your university years. Mm-hmm. And then third column, what do you love to do professionally? So for example, uh, you might have some things like, I love speaking to people. I loved, I always have loved talking in front of groups. I love things that are quantitative. Um, you might also add some things that you don't particularly love. You know, I'd rather be, in, if you're looking at the professional column, that last column, I'd much rather be in a uh, creating graphic slides than working in a spreadsheet with lots of numbers mm-hmm. and data. Then you kind of start differentiating what you love versus what you don't love as much. So it's really just about free association, list making of strengths, attributes, passions, skills, things that put you in your happy place. And then you start to circle some overlaps or some commonalities across the three columns that can lead you to your ultimate three superpowers. It's a great exercise. I was just jotting it down, Jenny. And and what I what I love about this three column approach that you actually brought it all the way back to when you were a youngster, when you were a young ki- a young kid, a young person, a child perhaps, and you're able to because it's one of those things that I've done in my career. I've looked back now and they say hindsight's 2020. I'm looking sure. back, I go, oh of course this is what I'm doing you know, based on what I loved as a kid. Well, that's going to lead us nicely into the the second piece, uh, or the second point, rather, Jenny, that you, you've offered us, which is cut, cut, cut. Tell us more about that. Cut, 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 cut 60% of text in your emails. What would it look like if every email in our inbox was a quick read? What would it look like if we could get through the hundreds of emails in our inbox more quickly because we didn't have any that we saved for a rainy day because they were simply too long for Mm. us to take in? If your email is five paragraphs, write in three short bullets instead. It helps you influence. It shows that you're strategic and it makes somebody much more likely to read your email. I love that. I love, and, and as you know, we call this point podcast, we call this podcast three points. <laughs> and that's specifically because three's plenty. Yes. Three's plenty, Jenny. Oh my gosh. We are speaking of cut, cut, cut. We are cut from the same cloth, Tony, pun yes. intended. <laughs> this is like th- the three points speaking, speaking my language. And right before we pressed record, you taught me a Yiddish word, which I had never heard of, which is so <laughs> ironic because I'm I'm the Jew on the call and you're Irish Catholic. And the word is, t- say it again. I think, I think, and I forgive my Hebrew, tachlis. Tachlis. Okay. Yeah, yeah, tachlis. yeah. So, so tachlis, which I Googled it and it means like, get to the good stuff, get to the point, get to the meat of what you're saying. And so I am all about that. I'm all about that with cut, cut, cut. And I'm all about that with the next point as well. But before we get to the next point, the benefit of cut, cut, cut is if you Mm. think of your senior executive or that customer you're writing to as someone who's booked back to back in 30 minute meetings all day, you want to have your email be the one they read versus the one that they just save and come back to maybe or maybe not another day. But oftentimes they never do come back to it and then you're not able to influence in the way you want. Or if you're emailing somebody requesting them to be your mentor, which is such a valuable thing to have in your career, a mentor, you are much more likely to get their attention if you're short and to the point. And it almost feels impossible, but it's it's possible. People often ask, well, how do you do it? Because there's that old, old adage, if, you, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. Well, here are just a couple things you can do. You can come back to it an hour later and look at what might not be necessary. You can think about what's important to you versus the audience and cut the stuff that's only interesting to you. You can have a friend or a colleague look at it. So those are three different ways that you can, uh, three different tactics, I would say, 
that can yeah. help you cut when it otherwise feels hard to cut. It feels like, but everything is important. No, not everything is important. No. No, and especially I, I, I subscribe to your second point, and it's, it's certainly the way I look at any written communication that I send, which is, uh, is this about is this for me or for them? And if it's for me, it probably doesn't need to be in there. So let's always start with empathizing with the person, the recipient, ultimately, especially you mentioned, and I know you're an exec at Google, especially having worked with executives at Google um, in the past on some big projects, the last thing I ever wanted to do was, you know, absolutely flood their inbox with lots of text, which I'm competing against a number of emails. And also I'm trying to make their life easier for them. That's my job. Exactly. And it, it all comes back to confidence because when you're able to succinctly get your point across, it makes you feel more confident versus kind of all over the place or not totally sure what your value is when you can break it down to what matters most, both either through your superpowers or by cutting your text, you will naturally start to feel more confident. I love that. Well, okay, you, you, you've dropped a teaser, Jenny, for your point number three. I'm curious where this is going to go. Uh, your third point, Jenny, is delete the octopus. Delete the octopus. What a funky name, right? I, I, I name it that by design to, to make it sticky. And delete the octopus is really just applying the same principles of cut, 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 which is how to be more succinct in your written communication to how to be more succinct in your verbal communication. So think about all the times that you're in an interview and you ramble on with a long-winded answer or you're in a meeting with your manager and you can't quite get to the point or you're in a team meeting and you're going around the horn and you come off of mute and you give your answer and it just drones on and you We've lose all been your, there. We've you lose all been your there, audience. Jenny. Right, right. And so delete the octopus is a way to remember to cut it down to the talkless, to the most important. So I'm going to ask for your audience participation, Tony. I'm going to have, we're, let's pretend we're in a, in a team meeting together, right? And you're, you're my manager and you ask me, what are the biggest challenges on your team right now? So first I'm going to show okay. you the, uh, a clunky way to do it. And then I'm going to show you a much more buttoned up way to answer this question. So if you could ask me, what are the biggest challenges on your team right now? Okay. Are you going to give me a real answer, like an honest answer from your team or no? <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I mean, uh, it's a, a so, some, some composite of different challenges right. I've had in the past. All right. I love that. I love that. Just in case your team's listening. Okay. <laughs> All right, Jenny, what are the biggest challenges on your team right now? Oh, well, gosh, we've got tons of challenges. I mean, we're basically a, a startup within the company right now. We're a brand new team. So we've got all sorts of things we have to prioritize. And I don't know that we're doing the best job prioritizing as well as we could. We need to figure out our metrics and our goals and we, what's important, what's unimportant. And part of the thing that's hard in terms of prioritization is the technology. And there are a lot of things that we should be using tools for or automation for that we're okay. simply not Okay, and, Jenny, and, I'm going to cut you off right there. Because if I'm your manager, I think I've had enough. You're stressing me out a little bit. Wait, wait, wait. But Tony, Tony, I've got, I've got to tell you about the third, the third piece, which is in addition to the technology and the, and the fact that we're doing things in spreadsheets when we could be using tools is that we don't have global alignment that we need to have. We've got an America's team, a European team, and mm -hmm. an Asian team. Yep. And, you know, when I was in Asia with our team recently, I, I, I was hearing their headwinds. And by the way, while I was there, I also got to take some vacation days. And, you know, I went scuba diving. I did this great yep. night dive where there was this octopus. Okay, and okay. the octopus was, was really cool. It was a unique one that I'd never seen before, even though I've been diving for 30 years. So, you know, anyway, I digress. So basically, we've got a lot of challenges on the team. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well done. What a performance. <laughs> and then the octopus just slipped in there. So is this the inspiration? I wonder. So, so that's it. So I, I, you, you, as my manager, you were ready to cut me off on my, you know, halfway through, I, I had to get to the example where I talked about my vacation scuba diving in my octopus because the whole point here, the whole point is that you can delete the octopus. Mm. You don't need to talk about the octopus. You can structure your thoughts in such a way that are easy to follow. And all it does is a little bit, all it takes 
is a little bit of preparation. Mm. So if you don't mind asking me the same question again, Tony, well, you know, Jenny, what are the biggest challenges on your team right now? I will now offer an alternative way to answer this, and then I can walk through how I got there. Okay, fantastic. So Jenny, what are the biggest challenges on your team right now? Great question. Let me just think about that for a moment. The three biggest challenges on my team right now are one, prioritization, two, technology, and three, global alignment. Prioritization, we're a new team, so we still have to figure out the important versus the unimportant. Technology, there are things I know we can be using tools for and automation for that we're still using one-off spreadsheets for. And finally, global alignment. We have three different teams across Americas, Europe, and Asia, and we could be much more aligned in our approach. So my three biggest challenges are prioritization, technology, and global alignment. Okay, that was much more uh, palatable, to say the least. And there was no octopus there? And there was no octopus because I no deleted octopus. the octopus. So how do you delete the octopus? Well, the example, the little vignette we walked through here, we were pretending we were in a team meeting. So if that's the case, you can simply write down all the things that are challenges on your team before you even come off of mute. You don't mm. have to be the first person to raise your hand. In fact, I recommend you're not the first person to raise your hand in that scenario. So you give yourself some time to think. So I might write down on my piece of paper, all right, what are all of my challenges right now? Maybe it's prioritization, technology, global alignment in my first answer. I also mentioned strategy. Maybe I would have thrown competition in there, maybe economic headwinds. And then I just circle the two or three that I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. When I finally do come off of mute, I simply lead with those three single words first or phrases first, prioritization, technology, global alignment. And then I go in to each three, giving a little bit more detail before ultimately wrapping it up with repeating those three again. I mean, it could not be more meta on this podcast because your podcast is literally called <laughs> Three Points, Tony. You're preaching to the converted. We're, we're, all in, we're all in for three succinct points. Right. And, and the example we gave here was being in a team meeting and being able to do this prep work ahead of time before you even come off of mute. But keep in mind, you can also do this with a, in, in a one-on-one -on -one with your manager. You can do this in an interview. You can say, oh, that's a great question. Let me just take a few moments to think about it just like I did. And even if you take 10 or 20 seconds, which I wouldn't do here on the podcast because your audience would think their connection is, is, is broken, <laughs> but you could certainly do that in a one-on-one -on -one setting and take a few moments to think. Let the other person catch up on their interview notes or let your manager, if you're in a one-on-one, -on -one, return a couple emails in their inbox while you craft a better answer. It, it sounds unfluid, but it's much more fluid and acceptable than you might realize. And the result is a dramatic increase in your sounding, buttoned up, strategic, confident. Yeah, I love that. I, I'm so glad that you dug into the one-to-one -one because I was sitting here thinking about how we've gone on this journey in the conversation, Jenny, from... Uh, the 75% lacking confidence to it's okay to pause for a few seconds. And actually, I, I suspect in your role as an exec that folks do end up just rushing into answers. I mean, would you pause? Would you help people and encourage people in your in your one-to-ones or in your meetings to say, hey, just take a moment and give people kind of permission to do so? Absolutely. It's such a smart way and a kind way to mm -hmm. create an environment of patience as a leader, an environment of warmth, an environment of acceptance and grace. And so for the leaders listening, please encourage folks yeah. who report to you, who, who you work with, that it's okay for them to not have all the answers right away. It's okay for them to pause because everybody just needs a breath every once in a while. Well, and you're, and you're going to get a better response. You're going to get better information, better data. It's a win-win in my book. For sure. And, and for those who aren't leaders who are listening, practicing the pause, practicing taking that beat before you answer a question, whether it's in a group setting or in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, 
that actually builds confidence in and of itself. You think oh, like, yeah. oh, if I pause, I'm not going to sound confident. No, if you pause, just like that, you sound even more confident. You sound even more credible. You sound even more centered. So for the folks listening who are not leaders, practicing that pause, which does take practice, can have incredible impact. Yeah, I love that. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that that, that was your third point, because it's a real uplifting one. It's very, uh, it's a very actionable thing that people can take away and try out and do. And I would even, I wonder if you would also agree with this. I also think those folks in a meeting or in a setting where they actually, not only do they pause, they say, I'm going to come back to you. Oh, actually leave that with me. I think, I think now, and again, as you say, it's something I've had to learn in my career that it's okay to say that. And not only is it okay, it shows so much respect for the other person rather than just like just sort of throwing out whatever comes to your mind two of the most powerful things a leader can say are i don't know and i was wrong of course you want your leaders to have answers a lot of the time and 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 we should but to have the humility the presence of mind and the vulnerability to say i don't know i was wrong in the appropriate times is incredibly high impact. Yeah, I love that. Well, listen, we have covered the three points and uh, we've talked about uh, knowing your superpowers, cut, cut, cut. And and finally, uh, which is going to sit with me for a while from your storytelling skills, uh, delete the octopus. And now I want to finish on one question, uh, which is how might the world change if we all implemented these points you've shared with us? I've wondered how the world might change if people implemented these points. Ultimately, here's how I want to make the world a better place. I want to give millions of people seven minutes back each night. And this is a very specific seven minutes. We lose so much sleep over our lack of confidence, our feeling inadequate at work, invisible, undervalued. And I've certainly lost sleep over these things, not just at points in my career, but at points last week. Mm. So I want to help people sleep better at night by giving them the confidence and the tools. I want to help people tweak big, small things to be more confident, like the three things I just mentioned, because everything... I do is about the big, small things. It's the name of my newsletter. Big, small things. What are the big, small things you can do that have impact? So I want people who are listening, if you're listening, I want you to toss and turn less because you're worried about what your personal brand might be at work. By figuring out your superpowers, you've just taken the first step to owning your personal brand. When you own it, no one will create a personal brand for you behind your back. I want you to not wake up in the middle of the night with a start because that prospective customer never responded to your pitch email. Well, there's a good chance your email was simply too long and you had to cut, cut, cut your email. Mm. And maybe had you done that, the customer might have converted a big, small thing. I want you to fall asleep faster because you're not overthinking how much you rambled when you came off of mute in your team meeting. I want you to stop replaying over and over again the ums or how you didn't quite stick your landing on your points because you spoke longer than everybody else. I've felt embarrassed. I've felt stupid. I've felt insecure when replaying over and over again in my head the clunky long answers I've given verbally. And I'm guessing you have too. Well, delete the octopus (laughs) to help with that. It's a tool to help you nail your message anytime you come off of mute. And that helps you fall asleep with the confidence that you spoke with intention, with structure, and with purpose. So that's how I want to make the world a better place. I want to give millions of people, hopefully some of you listening, seven minutes back of sleep each night. I love that. I love that. What what an incredible, uplifting end to the conversation, Jenny. Seven minutes back, I would I would very much value seven minutes and any time I can get back. So 
I'm I'm so grateful. And you, you mentioned your newsletter, and I'm going to encourage folks to give you a follow on LinkedIn and and jo- subscribe to your newsletter. But I'm so so grateful. We finally got to get, have this conversation. Thank you so much for joining the podcast on Three Points. Thank you. I was looking forward to this for so long, and it a hundred percent was a highlight of my day, Tony. Thank you for all the work that you do and for all the people you inspire and you truly are lifting up others. So thank you for the wonderful thought leadership you put out into the world. And thank you for giving me an opportunity to contribute to your audience's goals.